thank you all again for for joining uh, for joining me in this. Um, I hope you're all staying staying safe and healthy. Um, as Laura said, we're going to talk a little bit today about uh, the courtyard sculpture um, at the Ringling, the uh, the sort of unmissable bronze and stone uh, reproduction sculptures that um, sort of dot the, the the interior, the courtyard of the of the museum. Um, and I, I say courtyard sculpture, but a, a few of the sculptures I'm going to talk about aren't necessarily in the courtyard, so it's a little bit of a misnomer. Um, I'm sorry for that, but uh, you, I think you'll be you'll be pleased that I'm, uh, that I'm ex expanding the, uh, the range. So I, I wanted to address a few things here, um, here today. I wanted to first talk about how these objects got here, where they come from, uh, why, they're, why they're in the courtyard, um, what, they, what they show, what they depict, what, what they're about. Um, how do we, I also wanna talk about how we know what we know about them. I wanna talk a little bit about sort of uh, the, the, the art, art history and, and ancient and Renaissance sculpture. Uh, and then at the end, I wanna show a few, we're gonna show a few highlights and sort of have fun just talking about um, exciting, exciting stuff. So the first question is where do these um, objects come from? Where do these sculptures come from? This is a, a frontispiece to a catalog from the Chirazzi um, foundry. It was a foundry one of many um, in Naples, Italy, which specialized in creating reproductions, mostly of ancient art, but also of, um, of, of later periods. Um, and they, they, were, they, were also, they were one of a few firms that had license to take molds directly from ancient statuary um, and then recreate them in, in multiple, usually in bronze, but in, in, in oftentimes in, in marble as well. Um, using a method called the lost wax method, which was sort of an, an antique method that had been used, uh, later substituted for, for the sand, uh, sand casting method, which was deemed to sort of not, you don't get the same kind of detail you do from, from lost wax method. So this was sort of a, uh, this was a big deal. And um, they, they're situated in Naples, so they mostly, um, so they, they have a sort of a special relationship with the Naples Archaeological Museum. Um, which is one of the sort of foremost collections in the world of, of ancient art. Um, it houses the collection, uh, the Farnese collection, the famous Roman collection that was eventually ceded um, um, to the museum or, or, or rather moved to Naples. Um, and sort of perhaps more well known for being the site where a lot of uh, the, the statuary and art from Pompeii and Herculaneum, the sites buried by Vesuvius in 79 AD, um, where those are found. So Chiarazzi um, is probably the foremost of these, uh, or the most famous of all the Neapolitan foundries. They get very, they get very popular um, at the turn of the century in 1904. Uh, they are responsible for some of the decoration of the Italian pavilion at the St. Louis World Fair. And, um, and I, so they, they, they mostly have an audience actually of, of foreign travelers. They're certainly popular in Italy um, but they, uh, um, especially American, American um, businessmen ended, end up buying these. And John Ringling is one of these people. And we know, um, we know from, a, from a few documents in our, in our archives, um, some of which have been published, that in 1925, John Ringling is on one of his tours uh, through Italy. And he comes down from Venice to Naples. And he decides when he's in Naples that he's going to found this art museum um, and it's sort of this like eureka moment where he you know decides that he's going to do this and he's in Naples and he decides to buy these um, these statues from the Chirazzi Foundation and there's a sort of a funny story that's passed that was passed down through the generations um, of the Chirazzi foundry it continued up until really uh, a few years ago it had sort of changed hands a number of times uh, but apparently we're told, um, John Ringling showed up to the foundry rather shabbily dressed. Apparently this was, uh, this was something that he was, um, that, he, that he did often. He did, not, he did not dress up for the occasion, we can say. And when he made such a large order, he ordered dozens and dozens of these uh, reproductions, the people at the foundry got worried that the check was gonna bounce. So they had to contact the bank. They contacted the bank, the local Neapolitan bank, 
to ask who is this guy? Um, you know, why, like, is this going to work out? And after a couple of days, the bank looked into it and they said, it's John Ringling, his money's good, you know, execute the order. So, um, so he buys these, um, and, uh, and they, and he brings them back. Um, and we'll talk a little more about that. And then, so the other, the Kirazzi sort of becomes famous in, in a way because of, in the States, because of Ringling. It was sort of the foremost collection, uh, one of the largest collections of Kiarazzi bronzes in the world, in, in especially in, in the States. Um, and you, if for, some, for those of you who have been to Los Angeles, have been to the Getty Museum, or the Getty Villa, rather, um, there is also a large collection of Kiarazzi bronzes there, which were not ordered until the 1970s. Um, and actually, the Getty reached out to the Ringling. In our museum files, we, um, there's some correspondence between people at the Getty trying to get in touch with us saying, you know, what you have is really great. We're trying to do a similar thing. Um, and that's, and that sort of thing. So you know, let's see if this works. Okay. So this is just a historic photo of the installation of the David. Um, there's a sort of a story that, that, that John Ringling, uh, some of you may know this uh, or have heard this, that John Ringling originally purchased these for the Ritz Carlton that he was, that he was building. Um, I haven't had the chance, I sort of, I left this for the end and then of course we were, um, you know, we, we had to sort of uh, go home and, and work from home. So I haven't been able to look into this more closely into the dynamics of this, but it, um, it, it, it's uh, whatever, whatever the story is, that, that, that fails, that um, venture fails and he decides to relocate them uh, to the museum. That's what, what seems to uh, take place. And, I imagine most of you have been by St. Armand's Circle. A number of those um, statues were purchased by Ringling as well. And you can see a couple uh, are, are um, reproductions that we also have in the courtyard. Um, so I wanted to show these two photos as well. These are, um, these are photographs taken and published in a bulletin uh, produced, by, produced by John Ringling for the School of Fine Art that he was planning that was supposed to be where the current Searing Wing is now. It was never realized, but they made a bulletin anyway, and they, they came up with classes, um, and it shows a previous iteration of what the courtyard looked like. And I, I, I wanted to show this just to, to, to let you know that, that what you're seeing today when you walk through is not what John Ringling how John Ringling had um, arranged these sculptures, um, and that there are actually far fewer um, on display today than there were when the museum opened. We know from photos like these and guidebooks that they were pretty packed in. Um, I don't know, um, Laura, can you see my... Yes, cursor? we can see your okay. cursor, so when you point to something, we see that. Okay, so this is a, this is a statue, for instance, that is no longer on display. Um, that was on this balustrade here. Um, and then this is the Scythian uh, knife grinder over here who has moved all the way to the, uh, the, low, the lowest part here, right, right below the David. So things moved around, things were taken off view. Um, and so, but that's all to, that's all to show that, that, that John Ringling was very invested in showing, showing these. And they were sort of intimately involved with his idea of founding a school that, that a that someone that a student could come into the uh, into the garden into the courtyard and draw from this from these reproductions of ancient sculpture, much like any academy, any art academy that had been founded um, hundreds of years before throughout um, Europe. Um, so a brief so I wanted to include a brief note about the idea of like why why put sculpture in in a garden setting? Where does that where does that come from? Um, and it's, it's very much in the tradition of the Renaissance, Italian Renaissance formal garden, uh, usually arranged in, in a similar way with, with parterres, um, with, uh, with sort of bound by, by something, by a loggia, um, or by some, some, kind of, some kind of wall device, um, and with, with sort of well-trimmed shrubbery, uh, but you would also find you would also find a lot of sculpture here, um, and it sort of it, it it sort of unites those those ideas of, of of relaxation in nature, but also the sort of edification that can be achieved by by admiring 
uh, by admiring sculpture in a garden setting. And this was actually, this is something as we'll see uh, later on, uh, that was also very dear to the Romans. A lot of the, uh, a lot of the houses in, in Pompeii and Herculaneum did a similar sort of thing, um, garden settings with lots of um, statues. So I'm gonna go to this very bland slide that I created, I'm sorry. Um, but I, 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 wanted to, I wanted to sort of frame us, um, orient us for our next um, sort of discussion, which is how do we know what we know about antique statuary? Um, and as, um, as these antique statues were being dug up, especially uh, with, with um, more haste during the, the Renaissance, um, and were, they were finding their ways into famous collections, um, people started to look at these and ask questions like, who made this? What does it show? What does it depict? Is there a, is there a story here? Uh, when was it made? Um, where was it made? And to some degree, how was it made? What tools um, was it made from? Uh, also, what materials? Is it marble? Is it bronze? Um, and it took a long time for the scholarship to get where we are today. Uh, there, was a, there was a period when it was just assumed that these were Greek originals or, or maybe Roman originals. Um, and then it, it took a while for, for people to realize that actually what survives are mostly Roman copies in marble, generally, of Greek bronze originals. Um, and the reason for that is, is sort of simple. And the, the bronze is generally, is quite easily melted down. So it was reused for um, various purposes. Whereas, whereas marble, you can't really do you can't really do, do much with it after it's, been, after it's been carved. So this is one of the sort of reasons why, but, but when we're looking at, when you go to a museum and you see ancient sculpture, a lot of what you see is our Roman copies um, for a, you know, sort of a, an imperial or an aristocratic or a mercantile upper class. Um, uh, so yeah, so how do we, so back to the question, how do we know what we know? Um, so this is the Discobolus. Uh, you've probably seen this out on the, uh, in the courtyard. There are actually two of them out. Uh, there's one at the end of the Searing Wing and then there's this one uh, down in the courtyard. It's also, if you've ever watched the Olympics, uh, this is sort of the informal um, uh, poster child for, for the Olympics or the, or the symbol for the Olympics. So um, when we sort of determine period, author, subject matter, antiquarians, people who are interested in in, in, in ancient art had three main avenues of approach. They had the literary record, ancient texts, that is. Uh, second, they, they could look at signed bases. Not, they, were, they were relatively rare, but sometimes a base could impart some kind of information about the author or the period. Um, and the third way, uh, which is probably the most common way, is, is looking at other versions of the sculpture. Since these are copies, they're not, there's usually not just one. A lot of times there are multiple, uh, multiple copies of the same uh, original uh, type. Um, or comparative images. A lot of times uh, antiquarians are gonna look at stuff like gems uh, to determine. So we'll, we'll move to this. We'll, move, we'll first talk about the literary record. How do we know things about author, for instance? And this is, this is an example of where the literary record helps us with um, helps us with, with authorship. So there are two main texts that survive from antiquity that talk about sculpture in a, in a comprehensive way. And those are Pliny's natural history from the first century uh, AD. This is the Pliny that is, that is killed in the, uh, um, in the eruption of Vesuvius in 79, as we mentioned. Um, this covers a lot of classical um, Greek statuary. And then Pausanias's Guide to Greece, which is the second uh, second century AD. So these are our main sources for Greek sculpture from, you know, essentially the sixth century BC through to the first century BC. So this Discobolus was found in 1791. It's not the earliest one to be found, but um, quickly um, scholars were able to identify this as a work, as, as a Discobolus, which is just to back up a little bit as someone who is an athlete who's, who's about to hurl, he's bending and he's about to hurl this discus as part of the, the games. Um, and we actually owe, we owe the identification of the author not to Pliny or Pausanias, but to Lucian, who's also writing in the second century AD. And I'm gonna quote for you um, what we have, what we have 
from this. And it's, it's part of a, a dialogue. It says, surely you do not speak of the quote thrower, quote meaning uh, disc, who stoops in the attitude of one who is making his cast, turning round toward the hand that holds the quote and bending the other knee gently beneath him, like one who will rise erect as he hurls the quote. No, for that quote thrower of whom you speak is one of the works of Myron. So we know, we know now that this is, we can sort of safely identify from the, from the description that this is by Myron, who's a fifth century um, Greek, uh, a fifth century Greek sculptor um, and important in the classical period. Um, the, the interesting part here is that, and I, if you can see my cursor, I know it's probably kind of small, but um, the head here is facing down, um, is, facing, is facing towards the ground. And this was, this was an incorrect restoration. And this is something the head was not attached to the body when it was dug out of the ground. He would have been facing back towards the discus. He would have been looking back at it. As we, as we know from the literary record and other examples, I'll read this for you again. He says, um, uh, turning round toward the hand that holds the quote. So um, this, is a, this is an example that this is in the Vatican. Um, of, of, of just a, a restoration, not necessarily gone wrong, but uh, one that really didn't stick closely to the text. Um, and it's, it's interesting, he would have been looking back at the, at the disc because in the, ancient, in the ancient games, you didn't have to aim the discus. You just had to throw it as far as you can. And this created problems in Greek mythology. There are multiple stories of people killing people inadvertently with a discus because you would just launch it without uh, without, um, without aiming, essentially. So, um, so that's one. So we've talked about the literary record. We're going to move on to signed bases. This one we'll move through pretty quickly. I, have, I don't have a great photograph, but these are the old centaur here on the right um, and the young centaur here on the left. These are, these are placed at the entrance to the museum when you're going to walk up into the lobby. Um, and the bases are signed. Um, as you can see here, it's it's very difficult to see. I don't have a a, a wonderful picture, but it's it's I, I, I put it there just to 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 let you know that this is this is another another avenue that scholars had uh, when identif when identifying sculpture, and it identifies it as a work by Aristeas and Papias, who are who are Greek uh, sculptors. We don't really know a lot about them. We don't know if they were the copyists, they were the Roman copyists, or if they were the originators of the model that, that, that predates the Roman period. But this was, I put this here just to include information that th this is how we also know what we know. Uh, and the last one, and I think the most fun, the most exciting, and uh, the one that requires the most adventure, I think, uh, scholarly, you know, Indiana Jones-like scholarly adventure is is looking at other versions slash um, um, representations in the mi so-called minor arts. In this example, gems. So this is the Scythian knife grinder that we have here. Um, it was first recorded in the 16th century and it's earliest, people didn't really know what it was. So the earliest references we have to it are a Roman slave wetting his knife, um, um, sharpening the knife. Uh, some thought he might be a peasant. Um, some people thought he was listening in on a plot. He seems to be looking up upwards as if sort of, you know, training his ear on, on what's, what's happening behind a curtain. And they thought that he was maybe a barber uh, and that he's, you know, uh, wetting the knife so that he can cut someone's hair and he, he overhears a plot. And a lot of people suggested various theories, uh, various histories uh, for this. But um, he was usually just generally known as the knife sharpener until the 17th century, when a certain Leonardo Agostini um, sort of had, had been publishing quite a lot on gems, on ancient gems, and, and found this one, uh, which I've reproduced here. Um, and it shows Apollo, Marcius, and this Scythian slave, the Scythian knife grinder. And the story is sort of a gruesome one, but Apollo and Marcius, um, and Marcius was a satyr, get into a musical competition. You'll notice actually we have a, a few other representations of this scene um, throughout the museum, but they get into a musical competition and Marcius loses. And then Apollo, who gets to mete out the punishment, decides to flay him alive, to, to, to skin him alive. 
Um, and it's generally read as a story of hubris, of challenging the gods and, uh, and, and the dangers thereof. But um, the, the, the idea is that, that um, the idea here is that, the, that there was a, this third character in the scene, and that of the Scythian slave, who wets the knife, who sharpens the knife and then hands it to Apollo, who will then do the flank. And that's how we finally sort of identified the scene after about a century, a century and a half, as being um, one of a group, uh, um, of, of the sort of Apollo Marcius group. So, so originally we, we, we assumed that our, this statue would have belonged in a statue group that would have looked somewhat like this. Um, okay, so I, um, I'm going to move on to our next phase. So those are, that's how we know what we know. The next phase I wanna talk about, and I'll try to make this brief so we can sort of get on to questions and, and the highlights, but this is a, these are stylistic periods of ancient sculpture. And I include this portion just so next time, you know, you're walking through the, the museum, uh, any museum uh, or the or the Ringling Courtyard, you sort of can pick out examples uh, on your own without um, without necessarily having to go read a, a textbook or a, or a label or something. Um, so so I'm going to talk about these stylistic periods of of ancient Greek and Roman sculpture, uh, sent, um, uh, mostly. So the first one is the Archaic period. These are sort of rough dates. They run, it runs from around 650 to 510 BC. Um, and it's, 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 it's freestanding sculpture is sort of heavily borrowed from the East, from Egypt, um, and generally show these, the, the sort of the famous examples are these quarry uh, or youth, statues of youths, um, which are rather rigid in pose, um, usually with one foot, uh, one foot forward, um, and these are heavily sort of these are heavily borrowed from from Egypt especially, and they still sort of are they are they are not anatomically correct we can say they're not the the, the parts relate to the whole in sort of a geometric way not in any sort of anatomical way we might say um, so and the these were generally um, grave markers or they showed attendance to the gods. It was previously thought that they, these were all essentially figures of Apollo, but that's most likely not the case. Um, this one is sort of a famous one from, from the Met, from the beginning of the sixth century BC. And I've included one here uh, that is in our own collection. As some of you may know, John Ringling purchased uh, a lot, a, a large supply of Cypriot art, that is ancient art from, from Cyprus from the Metropolitan Museum. So this one actually also used to be at the Metropolitan Museum. And then John Ringling purchased it. And it's, it's a similar, it's, it's a statuette. It's a little, it's smaller, but it's from about the same time and shows a very, you know, someone in a similar pose. The legs are unfortunately missing. Um, but I, I include this, I include the Ringling um, piece to sort of highlight the fact that, um, that Ringling was, we think of, of the Ringling as the sort of, Baroque uh, museum par excellence, but he was collecting other things as well that um, that we don't necessarily associate with with his collecting. Um, so this is the first phase. The next phase is the classical period from about 510 to 323 BC. Um, so this is in this is in our courtyard. This is uh, one of the reproductions um, that we have. And just to briefly explain, so. I'm, I've, I've included information about the, the, the succession of versions here, but what we have is a modern early, that is to say early 20th century bronze cast uh, made from a Roman bronze copy that itself was copying a Greek bronze original. And this is, I know this is very, it's, it's very confusing. It's hard to sort of wrap your head around, but once you get the idea that there's these sort of intermediary versions, these Roman versions, um, it starts to sort of make a little more, make a middle, little more sense. So this, this statue is sort of uh, imitating styles from uh, the, fit, the middle of the fifth century BC. Um, it shows, you'll notice a little more range of motion. There's, a, there's an increased interest in showing the body, not just in a rigid pose, but actually the anatomy working as it would in a human, in a human body. Um, we also have more attention to, to depictions of the, of the human body. This is 
supposed to look, um, the, the study of anatomy is supposed to be, while it is idealized, it's by no means a portrait or meant to be uh, from nature, uh, but, uh, or, or rendered from nature. But the idea is that this is just generally the interest, uh, the interest in the classical period, showing more motion, uh, more interest in, in, um, in uh, an anatomy. And this is, this is called the Apollo, Apollo Kithoroidos. Um, he's holding in his right hand a plectron. It's just a, a sort of an ancient pick. And in his left arm, he would have been holding it. When this was dug out of the ground, it did not survive. This is from Pompeii. Uh, he would have been holding a, a katara, essentially a lyre, from which we get the word guitar uh, today. Um, so, and you'll notice his hair. I don't have a really good picture, but the hair is, is sort of curled around a fillet, which runs across a little headband, and then uh, runs and curls behind the ears. And that's very typical for Apollo statues of the, of the period, of the classical period. Um, so then we get into the Hellenistic period. Um, and a lot, of the, a lot of the statues that you will see out in the courtyard at the, at the Ringling are uh, marble, uh, Roman copies of Hellenistic works. Um, this one is the Dancing Seder. As you walk into the museum in the anti-lobby, it's directly to your right um, over in a, in a niche. It, you can, you can kind of miss it. It, 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 um, it can get lost. But the idea here is that new subjects were introduced, especially relating to the Dionysic world. That is the god, the god of wine, Dionysus. Um, and satyrs become very popular, like this one. Um, so there's an increased sort of range of subjects. And there's also new poses. As you'll notice, this satyr is twisting in sort of a, in, in sort of a helix kind of way. Um, and this was something that in the, that was a, it was something that the, the Hellenistic sculptor wanted to show off his abilities. They had sort of reached this point where they could, uh, you know, car uh, or cast, cast in bronze, and in some instances, uh, carve in marble, um, sort of, uh, twisting and contorting figures. Um, and this is, this is sort of a high, uh, something that's, that's important for the Hellenistic period. And there's another sort of, I would, we don't want to say advanced necessarily, but um, novelty we can say maybe um, in the Hellenistic period, which is the, the depiction of suffering. This is the Laocoon, probably one of the most um, identifiable, famous, influential sculptures from antiquity. Um, and it shows the, the priest Laocoon as he's being attacked, and his two sons, as he's being attacked by serpents. For those of you who remember sort of the Trojan, the, 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 um, the Trojan War, the war, the war between the Greeks and the Trojans, this doesn't actually appear in the Iliad, but in other ancient texts it does. Laocoon tries to dissuade uh, the Trojans from letting in the Trojan horse, and they're like, eh. And um, two, two um, snakes are sent to, by, by the gods, it, depending on, which text you read, it, it, the god differs, but are sent to attack him. So the sculpture is showing him in, in, in some amount of pain, some amount of suffering. Um, and this is sort of known in, in, in sculpture terms as pathos, that is uh, suffering that's sort of ennobled, suffering that um, uh, elevated suffering, we can say. It's, it's this heightened emotional state that becomes perceptible. And for the first time, really, Sculptors are showing facial expressions in pain, and I know I don't have it. I don't have it, you know, blown up necessarily. Uh, but Laocoon's face is sort of contorted and 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 in some amount of anguish. Um, and this is for the first time. The classical sculptors had relied mostly on hand gestures or or bodily position to imply a state of emotion. Here we get um, we get these heightened emotional states that are rendered uh, or made perceptible through facial expressions. Um, so the next one moving right through that you're, you're sort of gonna see the Romans, the Romans don't, the Romans inherit the Greek world. They're sort of interested in the Greek world. They go out and grab it. They go out in, in some cases, literally, they go to Greece and they take home a bunch of sculpture, something that we would sort of look down on today, of course, but um, this was sort of common practice. Um, and between, you know, sort of, taking sculpture from, from the Greek world and producing copies, they sought to imitate certain aspects of, of the Greek world. Um, so, but what, what, what the Romans are most famous for is portraiture. This is Lucius Verus, an emperor uh, from the uh, second century AD. Um, and as you can see, 
the Greeks had never really, until the Hellenistic period, um, had never really been interested in, in, port, in portraiture per se. Um, there, was, there was always idealizing elements. Uh, they were sort of types. So if you were a philosopher, you kind of looked like all the other philosophers. If you were a king, you kind of looked like all the other kings. It's not in the, until the Roman period where people really want to show off, and especially the first off, the Republican period of Rome. So before we get to um, around the turn, around the AD, BC, AD changeover, um, there's, there's an interest in showing sort of these facial features. Oftentimes there's, there's um, lots of wrinkles. And, and this is supposed to, the, the Romans were interested in showing uh, their civil, civic loyalty, their military attributes, weren't so interested in maybe idealizing. They might have thought of that as somewhat um, uh, unrepublican or, or, or something. And this is something that continues into the, the imperial period. And by the second century, as we see here, the Romans had, had come up with a, a new technique of drilling, of using a drill. So that's why we can get these sort of incredible, uh, this incredible curling, twisting beard. Um, and often called a, it's often called a Baroque hairstyle. Uh, Lucius Verus was one of the, one of the, he was really very interested in his own hair. Um, and we can say more about that later, but he was, he was very fond of his hair. Um, so uh, the, the, the Renaissance, so the Renaissance, I'm gonna, and I'm gonna go quickly through these. Um, most, John Ringling mostly collects um, reproductions of, of ancient statuary, but there are a few examples of uh, Renaissance and Baroque statuary. Of course, the David um, dates from, from the early 16th century. This is a, a Venus, um, the Venus of the Graticella um, by John Bologna. And he is sort of, the Renaissance is, 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 is digging things up, looking at, at, at uh, ancient models and wanting to not necessarily faithfully, faithfully replicate them, but um, are, are interested in them for the kind of forms that they, uh, that they, uh, that they have, that they impart. Um, and, and Venus is one of the, the most, uh, the sort of easiest and, and most common um, mythological characters that, that, is, that is sort of reproduced in the Renaissance. One, because she sort of stands for herself. She doesn't need to be part of a group like the Scythian knife grinder. Venus can just stand for Venus. She's love, she's lust. Um, and it's also an excuse, as was in, the, in, in, the, um, in antiquity, to show a, a nude um, female body, um, uh, which becomes more and more um, sort of part of the, part of the Renaissance. Um, it's, um, so, okay, so we're gonna move on. You'll, oh, so this is one thing. Um, uh, Giambologna was, was actively sort of looking at antique sculpture when he was creating this, this Venus. And one of the ones that very, very much influenced him are these, this type of the crouching Venus who sort of covers her breasts um, and, and is generally, is, is crouching. Usually this is associated with getting in or out of a bath. Um, and this is the same sort of, uh, what we see here is this, it's the same sort of um, conceit that she's uh, getting in the bath or, 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 or getting out of it. Um, and then we'll, 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 we'll cover this very quickly, but the, the, um, you, you will have noticed that there are a few stone sculptures. There's four of these uh, stone sculptures, sort of rudely carved um, stone sculptures in the courtyard. These are not Kirazzi. We don't know where they are. They're most likely, they're probably purchased um, when Ringling is in Venice or they're sent to him from the Venetian um, uh, dealer who he who he often works with, um, and this is the the rape of um, Proserpina by Bernini, and it's this is the this is the original that's in the Borghese Gallery in Rome. Um, as you can see, it doesn't it doesn't faithfully you know it doesn't totally copy by any means. That's why we, we'd sort of call it a variant. Um, but it was you know what John Ringling purchased was something good to put in your garden, something that could withstand Florida weather. Um, and so, and I think the idea, at least here, was to, you know, reference the sculpture without, without, you know, doing something in marble. I think it would have been a little, a little weird to someone to, to, to reproduce a, uh, such a well-known marble work into bronze, but, um, or a well-known work of, of the Baroque period in bronze. But the, the Baroque is also known for these sort of twisting figures, 
um, and, and for the sort of heightened emotional states, much like we see in the Laocoon. In fact, the Laocoon becomes a big, uh, of extreme interest for people like Michelangelo and later Bernini. Um, and, um, and yeah, I, uh, oh, and then the last thing that sort of, that the, the Baroque period is obsessed with, especially Bernini, also John Bologna, who's, you know, of course, Renaissance, but um, a predecessor, in a sense, to Bernini, is this multiple viewpoint. Um, potentially, there is no viewpoint that is not, you know, that is, that, is, that is privileged over any other viewpoint. So, you know, here we see that there's the three-headed dog Cerberus, the, 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 the guardian dog to the underworld. This is Pluto. This is Persephone. There's Pluto carrying off uh, Proserpina. And you can move around this whole sculpture and sort of someone's always looking at you in, in a sense. Um, in our version, that the dog is replaced by this um, nude male figure, um, but this is just sort of part of the idea uh, of a variant. So I wanted to, I know this is was sort of like, I didn't mean to sort of give a crash course in art history necessarily, but but looking at antique sculpture is often very, it's, it's often very difficult. And when there's this whole idea of copies after copies in different materials, it can get a little confusing. So I wanted to sort of lay the groundwork to then talk about a few, a few highlights in the, um, in the collection. And one I had to sort of talk about is the Apollo, is the Apollo Belvedere, which you will see on the sort of where the, uh, uh, the little, the little, um, the little circular area where the um, uh, carts come by, whatever they call the, the, the buggies. And I call buggies. <laughs> um, the um, so this this that's this is right at the front of the museum, and the Apollo Belvedere shows the god Apollo, um, probably having just let an arrow go from his bow, his left hand. He probably held a bow. Apollo was the the god of archery, of the hunt, something he shared with his twin sister Diana, um, Artemis Diana. Um, and it, it sort of become, it's one of the most, it's sort of one of the most, um, becomes one of the most influential and, and famous, um, statues in, uh, in the Renaissance and later periods. It becomes sort of the paragon of the Greek idealized, uh, sculpture. And, um, we, we, we see that in the sort of, in the heroic attitude and stance of Apollo, um, the somewhat, what would maybe consider a feminine haircut. He has a top knot, which is, uh, Apollo adopts, but is also known uh, in Aphrodite statues, but it's sort of like a little, little bow, um, a hair, a hair knot bow at the front, um, at the front. And he, um, he has very long legs. You'll notice that those legs are much too long for, for the upper body. Um, it's, it's, it's sometimes hard to, to really grasp what that means, but it's, it's showing this sort of idealized figure, uh, someone who, uh, someone who, again, this is, this is they're, they're not trying to show what Apollo may really have looked at. They're, they're, they're looking to elevate his, his person, his majesty. Um, and, uh, and yeah, and, and so, so how did, this is sort of a question now that we have to ask ourselves, how did some of these become so famous? Part of it was just chance um, and, and, and right place, right time. The, this is a god of Apollo. The Belvedere references the, the garden that was built uh, behind the Vatican in the early 16th century, meant to house, uh, meant to be sort of like a retreat for the, for, for the Pope, and meant to house some of the best sculpture that was coming out of the ground uh, or circulating um, in Rome, in Italy at the time. And this is one of the, one of the statues get, that gets placed there at the beginning of the 16th century and becomes, because of its inclusion in the Belvedere, sort of a surefire hit. Um, you know, if you, um, yeah, so it, it's, there's this, the, the, the reason that some of these um, artistic works are so enduring, some of them certainly were admired in antiquity. Some of these were very famous in antiquity, very um, written about, copied extensively. Um, and sometimes that sort of overlapped with, it happened to be dug out at the right time under the right Pope who put it in the right place. Um, that's not to say that everyone was able to see this. This is unlike the Ringling where you can just sort of wander in for free on, on, on every Monday. You would have to have sort of an audience. The, these, these statues circulated mostly in copies, casts, 
or m more generally or more, more frequently prints. Um, people would draw these and then they would be included in a book of famous statues to see when you're in Rome. And then that would be published in France. And you grew up in Paris and you wanted to go to Rome, you bought this book, you saw what you, what you wanted to see. And maybe when you went to Rome, you'd have the opportunity to, you knew the right person, you were able to gain audience into one of these collections. So the Belvedere, when you see the word Belvedere, um, you know it comes from uh, the Belvedere Gardens. Sometimes you'll see, um, if you're going through, we'll send out the e-museum package later, but if you're looking at a sculpture and it says something like uh, the Hera Ludovisi, that, ca that, come that came from the Ludovisi family in Rome. Sometimes you'll see the Borghese warrior, that came from the Borghese family in Rome. So the, 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 the fate of some of these sculptures as, as renowned often had to do with where they were at what point in time. Um, the next one, I wanna, I wanna come back to Lucius Verus because I love, I love Lucius Verus and I love how obsessed he was with his hair. Apparently he had very yellow hair and that he would, there's, I mean, there's, I don't know if this is, this is true, but apparently he used to sift gold dust into his hair to make it look even more yellow or, 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 or more golden. Um, but uh, the, the, what I wanna show, show off here is that sort of the, the idea of, um, of, of Roman imperial portraiture is something that you would, you, would, you would make a lot of portraits and disseminate them throughout the, uh, the empire, showing off sort of like, this is our, this is our guy, this is our, um, this is our figurehead. You know, heads would appear on coins. Uh, that's probably where they were seen the most. Um, but uh, there were certainly portraits of every emperor in Rome and in the provinces throughout Italy, um, you know, from, from Britain to, to uh, Babylon, you could find, you could find um, images of, 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 of the emperor. And Lucius Verus rules uh, alongside of his adoptive brother, more famous brother, Marcus Aurelius, Aurelius uh, from 161 to 169 AD. And Lucius Verus is actually, he's, he, Marcus sends him off, uh, probably recognizing that he is not, you know, so, as good as he is at commanding the state. Plus, apparently, he was a little bit of a, a ruffian. He was, you know, he, he went out drinking with his friends and that sort of thing. So he sends him off to the east uh, to fight against Parthia, and he's not home a lot. So there's little chance um, for new portrait styles. This is you know, sort of the, the, the Roman model is import artists from Greece who are still sort of the, the cream of the crop when it comes to uh, producing a, a statue or, you know, a, a life-size sculpture. And um, so he's, so most, most of his statues look, look alike. And um, so this, this is a, what we have is actually a monumental head. It was, it's larger than life. This is right when you walk out of the lobby, it's right to your left. So before you go into the courtyard necessarily, it's, it's right there, and it 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 sort of is a it's a cast of this uh, monumental head that's in the uh, in the Louvre, and um, it probably actually dates to after his uh, after he died. So whoever was making this uh, making this portrait of of Lucius Verus was either using you know old had had see, had known him at some point and could maybe remember the features, but more likely is looking at older examples and sort of making a pastiche of, of, of them. But anyway, we, this is sort of a, a ringling history. Uh, um, there's some in, interesting ringling history here. If you go look at this, it'll say, there's a little plaque underneath um, the bust, underneath the bust that says, from the Uffizi. It's actually most likely not from the Uffizi. The problem is, again, is that they all look so alike that it's kind of hard to tell sometimes, but it's, it's much more likely that, that it is a cast of, uh, of this Louvre, um, example that some someone later added this um, breastplate and and cloak on to sort of complete uh, complete it as a as a portrait bust, which is sort of an easier sell than just than just the head. Um, okay, so a few more. I, I I brought this one up. This isn't necessarily a highlight. Some of you may have. I, I, I mean, I walk by it all the time and I don't really look twice, but um, this, is a, this is a fawn with grapes and, and, and a goat. And I, I, I wanted to bring this up as an example of, uh, of this interest in the Hellenistic period of uh, showing satyrs. And this one has really all the accoutrement of a satyr. He's got grapes, he's got pomegranates, so that places him in this sort of pastoral setting. He's also got these pan pipes and there's a goat. Um, which also place him in that setting. 
Uh, he has a nebris, which is a fawn skin wrapped around. Um, the, the interesting thing is that if, if, if you remember, satyrs are sort of half goat or half horse, half human. And in the Hellenistic period, they get rid of those legs. They get rid of those goat legs and they decide a satyr should look like an athlete. So actually satyr types are sort of borrowed from athletes, which is kind of an odd, you think the opposite of an athlete is someone who drinks all day and gets very drunk. But um, this, is, this is sort of the Hellenistic um, mode of rendering a satyr. Um, and the, the interesting one about this is that um, this was the, the, the Roman marble copy that was found was in red marble, which is a, a kind of red marble called Rosso Antico, ancient red, literally. And um, it was very rarely used in life-size sculpture. And um, probably, so that, so it was sort of, it, it was a curiosity when it was, when it was unearthed and, 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 and taken to Rome. Um, and in this, in this instance, it, it, it most likely references the Dionysic world, the world of wine. Um, so, and just so, um, so you know that, you know, he may not have the sort of goat legs, but he, uh, he does have, and I, again, I'm not, I don't have a great picture and I, and I apologize for that, but there's these little waddles, these little caruncles that come out of his neck that I identify him as, as a mythological creature, as a non-human creature. Uh, you can't see it from here, but he has a tail and a number of the satyrs around the, around campus, around the courtyard, have horns as, as well. They're like little tiny horns. You have to look very closely, but these are sort of the the things. So if you see, you know, if you see a, if you see someone lying about, generally with some grapes or a wine skin, uh, you know, with maybe some something coming out of his neck, you can be pretty sure that that's Hellenistic, and uh, and a satyr. Um, so okay, so this is the sort of penultimate uh, one that I'll highlight. I know I, I don't know how long I've been going on, but I. Um, I apologize if I'm going on at great length, but this is the victory um, that you see when you drive up the, um, the promenade or drive up it to, um, uh, to, to get to the Ringling. And it was found at Pompeii uh, in the 19th century. It was rather small, actually. It was 46 uh, centimeters high. So this is, a, this is a larger than life version that the Curazzi foundry made. Um, and the, the sort of, there's this flowing wet, it's called wet style drapery, it sort of clings to the body. Uh, that is something that's begun in the classical period, continued in the Hellenistic. Um, and so in this, in, in, our, in our example, she, this, this um, victory is holding a sort of a pole, a, 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 um, a staff in her left hand and a, and, a, and a wreath in her right hand crowning a victor. But it didn't always look that way. Um, the Ringling example did, of course, but the, the Pompeii version was missing the right arm, and that stick that's in her left hand was added later. So she was most likely, in the left hand, probably held a palm branch or a trophy, um, and in the right hand, a crown, as we see today, or maybe a, a horn. Maybe she was in the act of, of blowing a horn. Uh, but this is an important uh, moment when Chirazzi and other foundries are have an important um, uh, that just sort of decide the fate of this sculpture. Whereas in the other sort of sculpture that was dug up earlier in and around Rome and ended up in famous collections, that sort of sealed its fate as a famous work of art. This one is not so famous. It's sort of buried in the, in the Naples Archaeological Museum. It doesn't appear in its catalog, for instance. Um, it's, it's little known as an antique sculpture, but it became widely disseminated um, in the 19th century. So Chiarazzi or one of these other foundries um, puts a wreath on, on the right, on, on, uh, they complete the sculpture um, with, a, with a wreath um, in the right arm. And they are used um, extensively for war monuments, especially after World War I in Italy. It was very sort of a, a convenient choice for a war monument, crowning a victor or, or the dead. Uh, and also there's sort of the easy, uh, the easy reference, the, the, the first and third kings of Italy were named Vittorio. So vic victory, victor uh, was sort of an easy, an easy play. Um, but they also, become tra they also become souvenirs for Europeans. Europeans, like, like we said, Europeans and Americans would come to Naples and want to buy these things. And the victory becomes sort of a, a well-disseminated one. As some of you may know, John Ringling buys four of them. We have one in Gallery 21. There's one on his desk at the Cotizan, and then there's 
uh, there's another one, and then there's the one in the, um, at the front of the museum. And we also know that this is, I know <laughs> a lot of our programming comes back to the Emperor Justinian, but it's such a complex and interesting painting. And of course, the, the, the efforts to restore it were, 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 were wonderful and, and brought, a, brought a painting back to life, essentially. But we know that Benjamin Constant owned one of these sculptures. There are pictures of his studio uh, where, he, where he's sitting and there's a, there's a victory, like our victory, in, behind him. Um, and this is in, for those of you have, who have not had the chance, this is in Gallery 21 now. And right above uh, Justinian's head, he includes this um, victory sculpt, uh, sculpture. So it, it, it's sort of a, it's a, it's, it's an interesting case of, of the restoration sort of uh, and, its, and its later use making it um, a well-disseminated sculpture, even though the sort of the ancient one that was dug out of the ground is, is, is really not, not much remembered. Um, okay, so finally, I had to talk about the David. I am sorry if you've heard too much about the David over the years, but um, I felt like I had to talk about it as sort of the, the uh, crowning jewel of the uh, of the museum. Uh, it's, it's, it's meant to, so it's, 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 uh, it's, the David is, is, is by Michelangelo Buonarroti, famous uh, Renaissance um, Italian sculptor. Our bronze cast is sort of was meant to be life, not life size, but the size of the original, which is around 17 feet high. I think ours is a little shorter, the, the bronze, the process of, 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 of um, casting it sort of uh, tightens it a little bit, makes it a little, uh, shrinks it a little bit, makes it a little smaller, but it's close. Uh, I don't think anyone's counting, you know, inches here, but um, so it was created in uh, between uh, 1501, 1504, just as Michelangelo returns to Florence. Uh, he, the, this is a period which is called the Florentine Republic. The Medici had been kicked out in, 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 in the 1490s, and there's, there will be a short-lived Republic in Florence between 1494 and 1512. Uh, and it's, and it's the, the Republic of Florence that sort of starts commissioning all these great statues that kick off another era of uh, Florentine sculpture. The, the, the uh, 15th century had also had its, its great masters as well. But so as you probably know from you know, all the stories, it, it's, ca it's uh, carved from one block of marble that had been used multiple times or uh, there had been attempts to to render something out of it uh, multiple times, and this has sort of contributed contributed to the legend uh, around the David, which there are many. There's one uh, the art historian Vasari writes that uh, that Michelangelo went up and and was carving it, and 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 the uh, the the person who commissioned the sculpture said ah, it doesn't look right. So so uh, Michelangelo takes some dust, acts like he's carving, and throws it down, and the and he says, now, now what do you think? And the, the guy who commissioned it says, oh, much better, much better. So, you know, this is a, a uh, you know, probably apocryphal, but, um, you know, sort of part of the idea of the, the David as a legendary statue, probably the most recognizable statue. So he, um, he, he um, carves this out of one block of marble, and it's actually meant to go up on the Duomo in Florence, for those of you who have seen the Duomo, which is, again, one of the sort of most famous icons of the Renaissance or have been there, it was supposed to go rather high up on the, uh, on the church. And once it was carved, it was, it was clearly agreed that this was just too good to put all the way up there. You wouldn't have been able to see it. Um, and some people actually think that there's, a, there's sort of a tie-in, Michelangelo, that the head is so large and the hands are so large uh, that that was some of the reason why he, he did that, because to see it from, from so far below, he wanted to emphasize certain aspects of, of, of the David. Um, so, um, but anyway, so it's, it's not going to go up on the Duomo. So a commission is formed to decide where it will go. And all the famous artists in Florence are there. Filippino Lippi, uh, Botticelli's there, Da Vinci's there, the San Gallo brothers, the architects are there, and Piero di Cosimo is there. You'll know Piero di Cosimo from the uh, building of the famous building of palace, building of a palace painting, which is in our gallery four now. Um, but anyway, they decide for it to go in front of the Palazzo della Signoria, which is sort of the epicenter of the Florentine Republic. And it stands there until the late 19th century. So it is sort of associated, uh, it's built or it's carved during the Republican period, associated with uh, 
with Republican fortitude, with the heroic struggle of the uh, Florentine Republic, and sort of continues on. Um, you know, it, it was a much debated work as now. Uh, its significance was 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 hotly debated at the time and in succeeding um, generations. And it is certainly a masterpiece. It's it shows off Michelangelo's understanding of the human body of antique. Uh, of ancient sculpture, some of which we've seen, the nude, the nude male body shown here, colossal. Um, and the, the, the subject of David was not, was not necessarily new. Florence was, had long, Florence under, especially under the Medici, had been long associated with Hercules. But in the, in the Republican period, sort of a, a biblical figure was preferred, uh, David. And in the previous century, David had been shown as this sort of princely, young prince. Uh, Verrocchio and, and Donatello both show him a sort of haughtily standing over um, uh, Goliath's head. Uh, but here we get a young, muscled, a, a muscled young man poised before the moments of the battle. He's not showing him after, he's showing him uh, before. And that's sort of significant in the sense that it's sort of a, an eternal image. He's, he's always preparing for the battle. Um, and it's something that sort of reflects, I think people, people in the period saw it as, as, um, as having to do with the sort of the, the struggle of, of the Republic to stay, to stay alive. Um, and uh, so, so anyway, so yes, it's become sort of the most, the most recognizable sculpture and exists in many copies throughout the world. Um, and of course now um, it is on the crest of, of um, Sarasota. Um, and it's interesting, interesting point, Sarasota, the, the government before they, uh, the city, the city, before they um, used the David on, on all crests, they used it on their stationary, but they thought that the front pose was a little too lewd, so they turned it around, and it was the backside of the David that, was on, that appeared on the stationary for some time. So anyway, but it, it sort of definitely it sort of evokes now the idea of, of, of uh, Sarasota as an arts town, um, and has become sort of you know, a symbol of, of the city and of the ringling, um, and, and yeah, so I, I finish here. I, I wanted to include, uh, this is uh, literally taking 30 seconds with this, I promise. But I wanted to show also just some other ancient art that you can see at the Ringling. Uh, of course, these aren't what we have just seen aren't ancient works, but John Ringling did collect ancient works. And I, I think clearly he thought about collecting broadly so he could sort of show the progression of, of Western art. And you can see this one in Gallery 17. This is an amphora, um, uh, 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 an example of painted. Uh, Painted wares in Greece. This is in the. This is, shows the Emperor Gallienus, perhaps not the Emperor Gallienus, but a, a person from the same era. Uh, this is in the. Um, this is a marble bust in the lobby that you can see. It's sort of hidden in a niche, but if you if you walk in the lobby and turn left, it's the one. It's the one there. And I wanted to include this because I was just the the Ringling has a remarkable remarkable collection of ancient gems purchased from the Gavet collection through the Vanderbilt collection. Uh, Ringling purchases these uh, these items. A lot of them are on view in Gallery Three. A lot of the gems. This one is not, but it shows Lucius Verus, and I thought it would be it was sort of a nice tie-in with um, with already. I mean, I don't know. It, it's silly to speculate. Maybe John Ringling had an interest in Lucius Verus. Probably not. This is probably a coincidence. But um, it's it's you know to show that there's there's a lot to be um, explored in the Ringling um, collection and a lot to sort of. Uh, to, to juxtapose and compare. So I, I will leave it there. Um, if, if there are any questions, comments, I, I, I happily, um, you know, I, I welcome them. I, uh, yeah. And this is the part where you can feel free to just unmute yourself and jump right in if you've got questions or comments for Kyle. Kyle? Yes. Uh, those copies uh, that are outside that are not bronze but are stone, mm -hmm. uh, are, they, are they stone or are they carved uh, generally or are they uh, cast or poured or uh, what type of concrete? I think they are, I'm not, I'm not quite sure. I think that they are, I think they are sort of, I think they're carved. I think they're sort of rudely, rudely carved um, variants. I imagine a a workshop producing these in bulk. Uh, I haven't done too much. We don't know mm -hmm. where they come from. I haven't done too much research on them. Uh, unfortunately, I think 
probably a little bit of bias. The other ones are sort of yes, yes. reproductions, but <laughs> they are interesting. They are certainly interesting and, and large too. They command a certain presence. So yeah. I've, in I've, limestone maybe, in, in limestone, not certainly not marble, but. Yeah, I thought I thought maybe limestone. It looks kind of, mm -hmm. it looks maybe a little like that. But I, I, I really, I would, I think I would need someone, uh, definitely an expert in, in in something like this, to look at it and, and decide. But, but thank you for bringing that up. Thanks and uh, thank you. Uh, um, Kyle, we got a question from the chat from Agnes. She's asking, who is the figure on the breastplate of Lucius Verus? Is it Medusa? It, it is a it is a gorgon yes yeah, so it is it is a gorgon head usually that is is what appears on the on the upper part of a breastplate in, of a Roman emperor um, these uh, these sort of Medusa gorgon heads are, are are fairly are fairly common and we don't actually know a lot of, uh, we don't know a lot about you know ostensibly someone just wanted to add this this marble piece to this bronze. Uh, this bronze cast of the head, whether that is an, that is ancient, it's probably not ancient. It's probably 19th century, um, but uh, but certainly meant to imitate what a uh, what a what a Roman imperial breastplate would would look like. Kyle, yes, can you say a little bit more about what you described as wattles or carotids, the little lobes on the neck of the bronze figures? I've always been curious about those. How did those signify satyrs as opposed to people um i th i think that they are i'm not sure they're certainly they're certainly i think they're exclusive to satyrs in antique statuary i would have to i would have to check on that but it's it's sort of showing the the satyr as as a as a mythical as a mythical being i don't know if it's part of its iconography stable stable across um um, across the entire Hellenistic period, but certainly multiple examples at the Ringling uh, show show this. So, I mean, a, a lot of times in in, in Greek statuary, um, figures are meant to be just you're, you're, they're meant to be details that give it away as someone who's Greek or someone who's non-Greek. The Scythian slave, for instance, has a very high uh, what is it called? His, his his hairline starts pretty far back. And that's supposed to sort of, and he has sort of like pronounced lips. And these, this is supposed to identify him as non-Greek. In a similar way that, um, that, that sort of the haircut of Apollo signifies him as Apollo. The, the neck waddles are there to signify a, a, a non-human being. Because you might, you might mistake him for one. If you don't look closely, like we talked about, he, he looks like an athlete with grapes. So um i think that's um that's generally the idea in in in, in greek statuaries to to show to use details to impart a certain genre or or person but but yeah i i don't know i don't know i would love to learn more i i suppose i i would love to learn more about spe specifically that trait of course the something like a tail or a horn is more uh you see that or that's more recognizably a, a satyr so anyway Thank you. Kyle, I have two questions. Okay. Uh, the first is a bit on the geeky side. Um, Laura mentioned at the beginning that uh, your presentation was being recorded. Mm -hmm. And if it has been recorded, will it be available to download to my iPad that when I walk, my wife and I walk through the grounds, uh, we can enjoy your commentary about the various statues provided today. And the second question is the uh, Bologna, the Venus, um, I don't know if it was the quality of the picture uh, coming across on my iPad or not, but it gave the appearance that the lower torso of Venus was exaggerated uh, in its size uh, versus the upper torso, which seemed to uh, reduce uh, the, uh, the 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 portraiture of the of the woman. I don't. Could you just comment on that? If it was just the quality yeah. of the uh, picture, or uh, uh, if that was the intent of the sculptor? Thanks. Um, so I'm just going to go back to it, so we have it as a reference. The the um, the the history of, of, of the nude Venus dates back to antiquity to about the, the end of the fourth century, 
previously, well, Aphrodite will say, previously Aphrodite had been shown clothed. Um, and in the, in the end of the fourth century, she's first shown nude. And part of this, part of the interest, and you may, you know, this, it may seem laughable to us today, but part of the interest was in fact erotic. Um, part, of the, part of the idea was that you were showing the god, the goddess of, of lust and love uh, nude. Hitherto, only male artists, and this is in uh, statuary, that is, had been shown nude. So the type gets sort of fixed, and it shows, uh, it shows Venus, um, I think you're right, with sort of uh, maybe um, sort of rounded features, um, a, 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 lower, a lower abdomen that's sort of, um, that's sort of, uh, uh, rounded in a sense, or or, or not, not bloated necessarily, but but we we'd say like the curves of of this. I guess what a modern viewer would say it's a curvy, um, uh, it's, a, it's a female nude that's that's curvy. But this is this is this is this is this is something that's set in the in the ancient uh, in the ancient period. Um, and what what's sort of interesting is that it 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 continues throughout the Renaissance. The male pubic hair had always been intricately carved since since classical Greece. Whereas it never is in um, in ancient um, statues of women, and that continues into uh, into um, the in the Renaissance. As far as your first question, um, as far as your first question goes, I think I don't know if it will be posted, Laura. Maybe this is for you, but we are planning content for um, downloadable content, uh, audio guide, and and as we've said, we've disseminated this e museum package. Uh, with information about these sculptures. So, Laura, we... Yeah, so the, the video will be posted up on YouTube, so you'll be able to access it that way. But just before we started this talk, Kyle and I were thinking about um, having him share some of this information as an actual audio tour. So when you're at the museum, you can just stream it um, right from your phone and then have Kyle walk you through the galleries while he's, you know, talking in your ear about the different sculptures. So, yeah, definitely we're going to explore different ways to get this information to people while they're in the galleries. Um, and then I think ultimately, Kyle and Sarah, when it's safe to distribute, you know, laminated handouts, we will remake those information cards that, you know, give out information about the different sculptures and have those available as well. We used to have iterations of those, but they got kind of worn down and outdated. Um, but the thing Kyla was mentioning, the e-museum package, if you haven't been on our e-museum site, um, it's really great. Uh, it, it's got all pretty much everything in the collection there. And Kyle has created a package. It's in the chat. So if you go to the chat box, I'll, I'll re-highlight that um, there. And you can click on that and go through kind of at your own pace, um, looking at the different objects um, that are in the, the courtyard. And there's additional information about it that way as well. Yeah, but just to ju just to jump back in, my, my thought was to to capture the spontaneity of some of the uh, uh, comments that Kyle was making when you're actually walking through, <clears throat> where you can have it your your uh, uh, iPad and basically reproduce the lecture and comments, uh, you know, as opposed to the uh, um, you know, pamphleted uh, information from the museum. I think the the spontaneity, the comments, the you know, digressions I think are really kind of cool when you're going when you're going through this to appreciate so um, kudos to you in that regard really great well thank you yeah no I think yeah if you're and I don't know if you're able to download YouTube videos but if you're able to get a connection then you should you know yeah if, if you wanted to you could pull up the YouTube video um, while you were at the museum and, and watch it in real time as well that's definitely an option okay I great think, I think Mary did you have your hand up at one point Mary are you good I did, but I decided Kyle had enough questions. I can catch you another time. <laughs> Thank you. This was fabulous. Of course, of course. And Marge, do you have a comment or a question? Let's just unmute you there. Okay. There you go. Thank you. Uh, Kyle, I, this is a question about museum stuff. Uh, you mentioned earlier that the Met had sold John Rengling, some Kouros and other statues. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering, is that typical of museums to sell off their part of their collection to other museums and is that still being done and why would they do that that's a great question i i, I and it definitely i think it strikes the modern person as somewhat bizarre why would why would a museum get rid of stuff that it has uh it this the so the, the Cypriot collection in particular, the Met in the 1920s was offloading a lot of its 
collection. It was expanding and it had sort of changing priorities. So it, it offloads a lot of 19th century uh, paintings, for instance, one of which is also the, um, the Emperor Justinian, which is in Gallery 21, which John Ringling also bought. So the Met goes through this, this period where it starts selling things off. And in the case of the Cypriot collection, it had believed the, the, the Cypriot collection, it actually came from one, one man. One man had sort of been intimately involved with the founding of, of the Met, or, or its continuation, we can say, its, uh, its 20th century iteration and had given uh, all of his, uh, most of his um, antique Cypriot art to the Met. And then the Met decided in the late twenties that it had copies, it had, or not copies, but um, duplicates in a sense. Like it didn't need four signet rings. It could, it could manage with two or, you know, th that sort of thing. And we've been doing research. We have a, um, a researcher in, um, in from, from Philadelphia who's been helping us with that, with that collection. But, so John Ringling got a, a, a steal. He bought, he bought it all for, for, for not particularly much. And it turns out that we actually have some interesting examples that are not uh, to be found at the Met um, as well. As, as for, is that practice today? Generally, no. It's generally looked, I won't say looked down upon, but it's seen offloading um, collections is seen as sort of risky um, and something that, you know, especially when you're selling when you're deaccessioning or selling to buy something else. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it recently happened. I don't remember who it was. It might've been the Baltimore Museum of Art who is sort of famously only co collecting this year um, paintings or art by, by women artists. Um, I think they may, I think it was them, but I could be wrong. Could have been, it could have been someone else, but recently um, um, deaccessioned or sold some of, its, some of its works. But no, it is, it's, not, it's certainly not in common it's not a common practice, and uh, and yeah, it's uh, the auction houses and the galleries are now are usually the places that you know you're going to find your stuff. So. Thank you. Well, Kyle, since you do have more time, I have two quick questions. Okay. One is the placement of the different sculptures. Was there a sort of master plan? Do you know where everything was? And the second one is I know that Ringling purchased for entrepreneurial purposes, um, but I wondered anything that he or Mabel may actually have liked that they didn't just buy for its value, would that have been in Cartesan or surely uh, there must have been something they liked? So, so for, the, for the first question, I don't know. There was certainly, I have not seen any drawings of a master plan in the sense that like this, this sculpture is gonna go here because we, we consciously want it to go there. Right. You know, I, I think they were probably placed there. Um, you know, uh, maybe someone went through and said, oh, I like this here, let's put it here. But they, you know, they, they, they've been moved around enough um, that it's, you know, we've kind of like lost, lost track of that. But I think, I think the, maybe the, the, um, the principle behind showing the, the original iteration that I showed in those photographs at the beginning was to show off as much as possible and to sort of bedeck any sort of surface. So we see it on the balustrades there, which we don't, we don't have them there anymore. We don't have any sculptures on the balustrade. So I think it was, the idea was that you could, you could look at as many things as you could. They were, they were grouped closely sometimes. And I think that that, that sort of betrays some interest in, in that academy approach and that you would have yeah. so many things to, to draw from. It, it, we do actually have drawings from the architect of the museum of a hall of casts. There had been a, an idea to make a hall of casts. So casts of- huh, okay, that's interesting. Yeah, so there was, there was clearly some, some effort to, you know, to connect his, his museum of mostly Baroque art with, uh, with sort of the antique. Uh, and that doesn't get made, but he has these, these, these sculptures instead. But, yeah, it's, it's, it's sad we don't have a lot of documents, you know, it, it would have been nice to have something that said, you know, John Ringling told us today to put this here because of, you know, ABC. But unfortunately, we have to sort of extrapolate. Um, certainly, it's trimmed down now and a little, you know, meant to, uh, meant to, meant to be for easy viewing now and not no, so right. much for, for... And so many people ask about them, it will be really nice to have just anything that can add to... <laughs> no knowledge at all by the, by the masses of us. Yes, yeah, no, I'm, I'm, I'm glad. 
I'm glad for that. And it's been a fun, it's been a fun project. And the second question, I'm sorry, now it's escaping me. I was about to write it. Oh, well, I know that much of his buying was to show his success, his entrepreneurship, mm -hmm. um, uh, and that he had conservators and historians advising him. Mm -hmm. But was there anything in the art museum or hopefully at least in his home that Ringling looked at and said, I really like this, let's buy it? Or did it all have a bigger purpose? I'm, I, I don't know if we can sort of uh, consistently answer that question across the, the collection, of course. I mean, we, Sarah and I, and I think uh, Sarah saw, I saw her, she raised her hand, so we can, we can go over to her. But I, I wanted to one, one, quickly say that we, Sarah and I have postulated that he had some interest in the, the Nike or the Victory statue as something that he liked personally. I mean, he, he kept a small version on his desk. Um, he bought three other versions. Um, he bought a painting with the victory painted in it. And if something I didn't cover today, but I've been working on extensively, when you walk in the ante lobby, on the left, there's a sculpture of a, of a Roman emperor. He's holding mm -hmm. a on. And on the breastplate are two victories crowning a trophy, um, similar to the kind of victory that, we've, that I showed today. So we sort of, we've, we've liked to sort of, you know, wonder, like, did John Ringling just really like this particular mythological character. Uh, we can't really say, but I, let's see, Sarah. That's kind you, of where he was going, wasn't it? Victory. <laughs> yeah, yeah, maybe that, yeah, maybe it was, uh, it was, it was easy enough, you know, that, that connection was, 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 was good for him. So, um, Sarah, did you, did you, did you want to- I was just going to say about the sculpture and its disposition in the courtyard, that there was a lot more on view originally. It, it's in keeping with how the museum galleries were as well. The walls were absolutely packed with works of art, triple hung right. in just about That's every gallery. Yes. Yeah, so I think it, it's not, it, it was a desire, like Kyle said, to kind of show as much as possible, and get as much as possible on view. Um, as for what he liked, yeah, it, we don't really have any, aside from him going after certain things, and you can't always tell, did he go after it because he liked it or did he go after it because he thought it was something important to have or good to have? Um, it's hard to say, but the the sculpture of Ligia and the bull is one that I've tried to work on. We don't really know the circumstances surrounding that purchase, but that's something that John or Mabel uh, buy, and it doesn't fit with any, you know, there's no, there's no um, specific reason to buy that work you know it's not an ancient work it's not a famous work it's not even right. an episode from ancient history that's famous um so i kind of wonder about that if that was more of a personal choice an aesthetic choice but again don't know do you have his letters his correspondence but, uh, very few we have we have some correspondence but not much personal correspondence we have some business more business related things am i right kyle is that fair yeah, I think um, I think for the for the most part, we get very little insight into his particular, um, you know, the cor the correspondences or the and sometimes inventory lists don't cast too much light on on what he liked or what he pursued. And and maybe there's you know there's sort of notable exceptions. Um, we've recently sort of looked into the the Justinian. He writes that he really wants to go after this. He thinks he can get a good deal. He's seen it. He's, he's seen <laughs> but it he says he can, thinks he can get a good deal. I mean, that's, the, that's sort of, you know. There yeah, it is. <laughs> I, can get Again, it, yeah. I think I can get it for a good price. Yeah, so, but, you know, but then there could be many reasons he wants it, not only right. that it's at a good price, so. Yeah. Oh, well, one day someone will come across those letters saying, this is what I really liked. <laughs> yep. Yeah, that's the. That's Thank the, you. This is really cool. Of course. Thanks for all that you put into it. Yeah, like I said, it was fun. It was, uh, yeah, it's a fun, um, it's a fun project. So, and ongoing too. We're still absolutely working on. So, and we'll always be adding to this. So, thank you. Well, thank you so much, Kyle. This was fabulous. And like we said, we will uh, be processing this and sharing it on our YouTube page and continuing to work um, to get this information out in other ways for you as well. So, thank you, Kyle. We appreciate your expertise. <laughs> was thank you, Laura, great. for your wonderful lectures. Great. Many, many thanks. It was great. Thanks for hosting again, Laura. Oh, my, it's easy for me. I just get to sit back and enjoy <laughs> it. So. All right, everyone. I'll see you all soon. See you next time. Thank, thank you. you. Bye-bye.